So hi, everyone. Welcome to the HAI Weekly Research Seminar. Um, I'm Deep Ganguly. I'm the Director of Research at HAI, and I'll be uh, moderating today's event. So before we get started, just a couple of quick house rules. The chat on the Zoom is disabled, but we would love to hear your questions. So you can navigate over to Slido, either by pointing your mobile at that QR code or going over to the HAI events website. It should be a prominent link to join the conversation. I'll be monitoring that uh, those questions sort of throughout the presentation. And at the end, uh, we'll have a chance to ask um, Leo to sort of answer those questions. Um, so that's sort of it for house rules. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce you all to um, Professor Leonidas Gibas. He is the Paul Pigot Professor of Computer Science and courtesy um, by courtesy of electrical engineering at Stanford, where he leads the geometric computation group. Dr. Gibas obtained his PhD from Stanford under the supervision of Donald Knuth. His main subsequent employers were Xerox PARC, DEC, SRC, MIT, and Stanford. He's a member and past acting director of the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or SAIL, and a member of the Computer Graphics Lab, the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering, and the BioX program. Dr. Gibas has been elected to the US National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he's an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow, and winner of the ACM Alan Newell Award and the ICCV Helmholtz Prize. He's also a recent recipient of a DOD Vannevar Bush Faculty Fellowship and a Technical University of Munich Hans Fischer Senior Fellowship. Um, and so we're just extremely thrilled to have you here today, Leo. And with that, um, please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Deep, for the nice intro and also for the invitation to speak at this HAI seminar series. Um, just to double check, you can see my screen and see my this red cursor moving around. Mm, I don't. Okay. Yet. Then I don't know what I should do differently or I should maybe start again the presentation. Uh, let me see. I don't see any place to exit the presentation. Leo, if you could press the share screen button at the bottom. Okay. And then once that window pops up, you can select your presentation. Let's see, okay. Let's see. Perfect. Great. So you see now the screen and the cursor? Yes. Okay, good. So I'll talk about uh, a series of research efforts in my group over the past maybe four to five years, centered around this theme of joint learning over visual and geometric data. To motivate this work, um, we all know that uh, there's been very impressive advances in computer vision and actual language processing through deep learning. But these advances require very, very large annotated data sets such as ImageNet in the case of computer vision, as well as, of course, lots of GPUs and processing power. And there are many interesting settings in machine learning where obtaining quality training data at scale from human annotation is quite difficult. Uh, that's especially true in geometric settings, the areas that I work in. For example, if somebody shows you this image of a car and asks you for a 2D bounding box, that's very straightforward. But if you want to generate a 3D bounding box, which is much more demanding. So because of that, there's been a lot of uh, concentration in the community in protocols and architectures that reduce supervision in various ways. And there's uh, many names for these efforts, uh, these variations, there is transfer learning, semi-supervised learning, fusion learning, and supervised learning. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce one more variation today what I call joint learning that takes somehow a social aspect of learning, starting from the observation that when we have data either for training or testing, typically there's correlations among the data, but we have multiple learning tasks, there are correlations among the tasks. When we have representations of the data with respect to the task, there are correlations of these representations. So the essence of joint learning is to aggregate information over different data sets 
over multiple modalities, appearance, geometry, language, over space and over time, over different representations, over different predictions, over different tasks in settings where we are working or referring to the same entities in the world and therefore there are correlations between what we are observing, what we are learning and what we are trying to do. And so in this setting, the key challenge is the aggregation of information. The, and this requires, of course, information transport. Information has to be brought to the same place and it has to be put in a common format so it can be aggregated. So in this presentation, I'll go at a high level over some powerful tools we've been developing towards this end, such as voting mechanisms, abstraction and canonicalization, and path invariance and loop closure in information transport. Here's an outline of the talk. I'll, uh, I'll start with some brief background on object-centric 3D machine learning. The bulk of the talk will be on doing machine learning on point cloud data in three dimensions, and we'll cover multimodal 3D object detection, category level pose estimation, and latent spatiotemporal object representations. And then very, very quickly, I'll go over a number of other directions in my group that relate to joint learning, consistency among learning tasks, learning objects shape differences in language and affective language, emotional language for visual art. Background. Uh, yes, the world is complicated, but it's also decomposable into the stable entities we call objects. Objects are quite important because they maintain their properties, their attributes, and they get moved around and therefore they factorize the complexity of the world. And in my group, for some years now, we've been working on collecting data sets that facilitate understanding objects. One of them is the ShapeNet repository of over 3 million models, which is joint work with Princeton and UT Austin. And the key contribution of this work is not just the aggregation of the models, but the semantic annotations of the models. So ShapeNet contains the keywords that describe objects and their parts, contains geometric information about the object parts, object symmetries, has part hierarchies, part correspondences, and so on. And more and more our focus is to understand the interactions between humans and objects, so the affordances of objects, because almost every single designed object is meant to help some human activity. A key part of that is to understand object parts. So we've been working for some time now in, in you know, I don't, the annotating shape and data with part information here I show some some course parts this was our initial effort that led to about uh, yeah, the annotation of about 30,000 shapes with maybe three to four parts each is high level parts and this was an interesting collaboration between computers and humans because to get these annotations we had users look at the rendering of a 3d model they were given the name of a part say a chair seat and they had to paint on the on this image the part of the image that corresponds to this part and then we aggregated this information from multiple views and from multiple users pushed it back to the 3d model and then transported the information to other nearby models and then every transported piece of information was verified by humans and if confirmed we went into the database this uh, schematic shows the network structure here where the this is for annotation of lampshades and here are the orange ones and the ones that the some human annotated. And uh, then the, the green ones are the ones where some algorithms propagated from the human annotations. More recently, we have focused on fine grain parts from this PathNet repository on top of ShapeNet, where, for example, in a keyboard, even single keys are, are, are segmented out, or in this uh, trash can, every slot is, is segmented out. Um, and the reason we are interested in these very fine parts is because a lot of uh, interactions between humans and objects happen through hands, which are small, so they involve levers or buttons. And it's also the case that as we go down in scale, parts become more similar. And therefore, if we can understand these basic parts, then we can do the yeah, supervised learning of new shape categories that we haven't seen before. Uh, so in Parthlet, we have hierarchical segmentation of various semantic classes of objects. I show here the hierarchy for the class lamp. This is an endor graph, so the orbits do allow alternate uh, structures. 
So for example, both of these tables or desktop lamp and the ceiling lamp can both be fit into this one hierarchy. Once we have these uh, hierarchical structures, we can use them to create new shapes that just want to like existing shapes by using you know, graph neural networks. I will not go into any details. And one can combine the structure of the geometry in two parallel networks that communicate with each other so that in the end, we can generate new geometries like the ones you see here, and we can vary independently the structure or the local shape. So this was background number one. Background number two is uh, deep learning on 3D point clouds. Point clouds are extremely common modality now coming from LiDAR, from depth cameras, and of course from classical computer visual algorithms like structure promotion. Uh, they are close to the sensor. They are very simple, it's just a bag of points, but they are irregular. As compared to say images, which are regular pixel grids, here the points come at different densities. There's it's much more dense near the sensor and much sparser far away from the sensor. And also the neighborhood structure of, of each point is different, which means traditional convolutional architectures cannot be applied. And so one of the key efforts in my group over the past five years has been developing point cloud deep architectures, what we call pointed epomets plus plus, that duplicate in the point cloud domain what was done in the image domain for things like object classification, segmentation, scene understanding, and so on. And this work started a big wave of effort in, in the community in 3D vision on dealing with point cloud data. Has, so this, you know, this paper has like you know, many thousands of references now. Um, the key challenge here is to build an architecture that has the the point permutation invariance built in. Essentially, you are learning something that's a function of a set of points and not of a particular sequence of points that you were given. You want something that has transformation invariance. If you rotate an object, its identity doesn't change. And also sampling invariance, that is, if you resample the same object a different way, you're going to get the same result. You don't want there is, you know, the network to learn the sampling pattern. Perhaps the simplest way to think of aggregating your information uh, is to start with the, uh, you know, the coordinates of, of the points and then aggregate them through some symmetric function like max or plus and do some processing. But it's also very clear that if you do that, what you can learn is maybe a bounding box of your point cloud or maybe the center of gravity or some, uh, or some moments, but you will not really get useful semantic information. So the key to progress here was to use a load map H that lifts the 3D point into a high dimensional space that's meant to capture semantic information and then do the symmetric, the symmetric aggregation and the further processing. And that's the vanilla point net, the, the most basic point net architecture. In full glory, it looks like this. Uh, it has sort of two sections. This is the lifting part where from three dimensions, you go up to 1024 dimensions through a number of MLP multi-layer perceptron stages interspersed with, with some canonicalization networks that try to transform the data to put it in a more standard form so the network has an easier time understanding it. And then there is the aggregation part is here. This is the pooling and we're using max pooling to get a global feature by simply taking the max across each of these 24, 124 features that we have learned. And then we can pass this to another small MLP to get, say, per class output scores for classification. Or one can take one of these intermediate lifted representations, concatenate the global fixtures. So that you have a per point representation and a global context, and push that through another MLP to get the per point say, classification scores, as you might need in segmentation. An example of that is shown here, where essentially we are learning to segment. Uh, point clouds coming from 3D shapes. An interesting aspect of point net is that it's very lightweight and fast compared to, oh, wow. to previous methods that were based on, on voxelizing space. Because when you have voxels, you have to pay something everywhere, even, even when there's no, there's no geometry there. And point clouds simply sample the geometry when there's something to, to sample. So you are saving in order of magnitude in terms of the number of coefficients, 
that you have to learn. And actually, also saving uh, a lot of magnitude in speed. So this is a very lightweight architecture, useful for portable devices. It also has some other interesting properties. One is that the quality of the detections or classification degrades much more gracefully than, say, for volumetric methods, as data is uh, is dropped. And I want to try to explain why that is. Here I show some point clouds of common objects. The color just means depth, so, so red is near the observer and blue is far away. And you may recall that a key part of point net is this uh, max pooling, where essentially you're computing the max over all points for each picture. Again, in the basic point net, the points don't talk to each other. They're all isolated. Each gets lifted individually, and then they get aggregated at this max pooling step. So basically here, you are learning 1,024 optimization problems and finding the winner in this, you know, each of the 1,024 competitions. And here, what you see here is the points that were the winners of some competition. These are the guys that survive. These are the guys that go into the further processing. And you can see they correspond essentially to, to key points of the shape. The, the points that we would think are essential to understanding the semantics of the shape. And that's why dropping points doesn't affect uh, this architecture so much because the, the, you know, if you draw points that are not among these key points, the network will not see them. <clears throat> now, of course, it's not always okay to just uh, process things at the single point level or the global level. Often local neighborhoods are, are quite important. So then came Ponet plus plus to the hierarchical point net where we apply essentially point nets to neighborhoods of the point cloud. As shown here in 2D, we, here is a, a 2D point cloud. We take a neighborhood of that, the center point, and then in that neighborhood, we apply a point net. This now aggregates the information from this point and for the center point gives us its x, y coordinates plus a high dimensional picture that came from the point net. And then we simply do this aggressively uh, we call the setup structure layers in a hierarchical fashion, and then we can either you know, aggregate everything and go through an MLP for classification, or we can uh, go through an upsampling stage and go back to per point information for, um, for segmentation. A key challenge that we have to address here is again this highly variable density of points because uh, point N plus plus is hierarchical. At at low levels of the hierarchy, we have small neighborhoods. In sparse areas, you may have very few points. So there's a real danger that in that area, you don't learn what is the underlying geometry, but you just learn the sampling pattern. But I will not have time to go into that. OK, this finishes the background part of my talk. Let me quickly describe a couple of, of, of how this machinery gets used in a joint learning framework. Um, so the basic problem says object detection. I give you a point cloud of an inner scene, and I would like to come up with uh, a segmentation of the objects present, present in the scene, uh, their pose as shown here, and also their class label to know what they are. And uh, what I will show you very briefly is an approach that builds on a very classic idea from computer vision, uh, this notion of half transforms or voting, but now implemented in a fit forward and fully differentiable pipeline. So it can be put into a deep net. And the basic pipeline is shown here. We have the input point cloud. We sample it, we get the seeds, the blue points. This is furthest point sampling. And then every seed point votes for another point. That is, it creates another point. These are the red points. And each blue point tries to guess where is the center of the object that is part of. This is what the votes are. It tries to guess the location of the center and also generates some feature for the center. And this generates this red point cloud. These red points don't have to be part of the original point cloud. They are completely new points, which then are processed again as a new point cloud in a second stage to form clusters and generate uh, essentially uh, proposals for the bounding boxes and classes of the objects 
in terms of the actual architecture, it looks like this. It's two pointed cloud classes back to back. So the first pointed takes the point cloud and generates essentially the votes. This is the, the, the voting part. And then the second part is that takes now the, you know, the vote point cloud that from that generates the, the proposals for the balloting boxes. So effectively what is happening here is we are bringing together points that should speak to each other. Perhaps your, your indoor environment has a very long couch. Think about two points at different ends of this couch. Pointed plus plus aggregates information hierarchically by distance. So if these points are very far, they will not talk to each other until the very top layer of the, of the architecture, very late. We would like these points to be able to communicate sooner. And so if each of them understands and, 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 and can roughly guess at the center of the couch, then they will move close to each other so that they'll be able to talk at a much earlier level in the architecture. So a little bit, this is like uh, a capsule network in this guy. So it, it, it essentially it, it kind of implements essentially a communication that the capsule network would have implemented by physically moving the points. That's what the votes do. That's what happens when we go from the blue points to the red points. We move the points around so that points that that want to talk to each other, this is the joint learning part, can do so easily within the project plus plus architecture. So here's an example of results. Uh, this is the vote net prediction. This is the ground truth. This image is just for you to understand is the theme. Note that, for example, vote net found this chair here, even though that was not annotated in the ground truth uh, data. And one can look at more complex scenes from ScanNet where you have a lot of objects very, very close to each other, as you can see here. Um, I will not show many tables in this talk, but I want to point out that when this was published, which was in the fall of 2019, it was doing better than previous methods, but we're using both geometry and color. And of course, that shouldn't be so. I mean, when we have more information, we should be able to do better, especially since. Uh, um, Image information and uh, geometry information can be very complementary. Image can, can be high, can be high resolution and give you dense coverage. Uh, points give you absolute depth and scale, but they're sparse. Here you have, of course, you know, many imaging artifacts like you know, specular, you know, lights and, and occlusions and, and so on. So we want to be able to combine the two, and it turns out the obvious way of combining say that each point has uh, X, Y, Z, and R, Q, B simply doesn't work. These are very different modalities. I mean, the regression has to happen at a later stage of the network. So in some, in some, in some subsequent work this past summer, we essentially build a 2D voting mechanism also that can communicate effectively with the 3D voting mechanism that I explained earlier. I will not have time to discuss the details. But essentially, there is a 2D pipeline and a 3D pipeline, and then they get to communicate and integrate information at a later stage. And this gives good results. Uh, for example, you can see that uh, for our scanner, black objects are basically you know, invisible. You don't, you, don't, you don't get any points. And so you miss it in the botnet that's based only on the point cloud. But you do find the object when you combine both the image and the point cloud data. Okay, um, this was my, my, my first vignette. Uh, let me very briefly talk about uh, your pose estimation of objects. Uh, so the problem here is given an object, you want to know how it sits in the world. Uh, and the, the problem of kind of lifting, say, pixels from 2D into the 3D location where they are in the world can be complicated in part because the world can be complicated. And so our idea here was to try to do this lifting first into a more canonical space geared for the particular object that we are lifting the information for. So for example, if you imagine that you have a garage where you park your car every day, then I think it's pretty straightforward and park it exactly the same way, then I think it's kind of straightforward to think that if I give you, say, this pixel that belongs to this front left light, where will that be in this 3D space? 
So this is the notion of this normalized object coordinate space or NOx, uh, where we canonicalize position, orientation, and size, and lift these objects into a canonical space that can be shared among objects in the same class. And, and for us, this was easy because in shape and already, we have co-aligned shapes that belong to the same class. So essentially, we are learning a class specific container where an image of an object in a different class can be lifted into 3D. Here I show a camera example. And so what happens here is when, when you take the, you know, the image, we can compute this, um, this sort of 3D map from which we get this readout of how the shape sits in the world in this canonical space. And we were able to, uh, you know, to use this machinery to, for the first time, construct uh, uh, a technique for uh, computing pose of objects, even though we don't have a CAD model of the object. All we have to know is the class of the object. And we can still compute, say, the, the bounding box in 3D. I, I, will, uh, I will very briefly mention the method again, not in any detail. It's built on an architecture that's very common in computer vision called mask RCNN for object segmentation. Mask RCNN gives us a class head and an instance mask head that we augmented that with a NOx map head and also at a later stage, the depth that helps us know absolute size. The challenge here was how to get training data because as we discussed at the beginning, getting geometric you know, annotations is quite hard. And so what we did is we created this mixed reality data set. We went to IKEA in East Palo Alto and scanned lots of indoor uh, furniture environments. And then we placed on them uh, synthetic shape net objects. Like, a, like you see here. So, so we generated about 300,000 kind of this mixed reality images where essentially the furniture is, is real, but the shapes are, uh, are synthetic. Um, and then we also added some, like a small number of real world data are visited by, yeah, by hand and also some images without poses just to prime the master CNN network. And some result is shown here, for example, if you look in, uh, I don't know, this column, here is the, the input image, here is the NOx ground truth, here is the NOx we estimate, and here is the ground truth uh, bounding boxes and the ones we estimate. Uh, a key advantage of this technique is that because you are lifting data into a canonical space, you can aggregate multiple views just by union. You just you know, lift this into this and lift it into that, into that and just, just take, them, take them all together. This was useful for us because we built this gantry for understanding how humans interact with objects that have, say, five cameras. So we want to be able to take the information from all these five cameras and integrate it. So this is multi-view aggregation of information. And let me, uh, the third vignette, talk about spatiotemporal point clouds now the aggregation not over space, but also over time. Uh, this is, of course, quite important for self-driving cars or for understanding a human motion. And we want to here find a representation of object shape over time, given the spatial point clouds that I'm showing. Um, and we want this representation to have properties of continuity in space and time. That is, we want to be able um, to uh, to generate new views or to sample unseen instances, to be robust to partial and irregular sampling, and to generalize nicely to new instances from the classes that we train on. So we have an input point cloud sequence. This does not have to be uh, continuous, can be intermittent, and, and we want to do the shape aggregation, basically in the way that I indicated in the previous uh, a vignette by going to canonical space, but also understand how the object was moving in between. We're gonna get a motion encoding as well as the shape. And so this is this Casper work we just published at NeurIPS uh, last December, where we take this, uh, this uh, sparse special views of a moving object and we map them into a canonical space. 
and in a way that allows us to aggregate just by unioning and also generalize easily to new instances. At the same time, we also can localize time. And in fact, uh, a key part here was to develop this temporal point net plus plus that works on this uh, spatiotemporal data. And it briefly, uh, again, I will not go into much detail, it looks at each x, y, z, t as a point in space time and as a point net on them. And therefore, for every, for every single t, it looks at just the special points and does a point net plus plus on them and puts this together into this descriptor. Uh, there's something slightly interesting going on here because this avoids having spatiotemporal neighborhoods, which are hard to define because the time dimension is not of the same ilk as the spatial dimensions. So what happens here is this, this network produces two outputs. One is this canonicalized uh, space uh, that I just discussed, and also a latent representation of the motion where we have essentially this canonicalized sequence at the observed time step, but then we're gonna be able to generate arbitrary intermediate points of the sequence, even though this were unobserved. And to do so, we essentially learn a neural ordinary differential equation that given any initial latent states, there's a dynamics network that is learned and it can advect the initial state forward in time in this latent representation. So this is the key part of the architecture. And I want to focus a little bit more on this latent ODE because I think that's an interesting part of the project. Um, there's actually two components here. There's a static feature that represents the shape and a dynamic feature that represents the motion. The motion does not have to be rigid, it can be an articulation also. And a key issue here is how to go from the latent representation to the real 3D. How do we do this mapping? And for this, we use a technique known as point flow, where we start with a, a Gaussian sample it, and then advect those samples uh, through a continuous normalizing flow to form the shape that we intend to recover. An attractive feature of this method is that one can also do it backwards. That is, this, uh, there's, no, there's no information loss here. You never have two points here mapping to the same point here. So you can always trace back to where you started. And this is a way to uh, both estimate a, a reconstruction loss, how well we're recovering the ground truth shape of the object, as well as the canonicalization local, the local loss for the spatial part. So here I show some examples. Um, this is the input frames, and this is the ground truth union of them. And here is what Casper recovers. Uh, and you can, you know, it's, it's a little bit more noisy, but it comes pretty close to the ground truth. And also, we can get by with very, very few samples. Here, we start with three steps, three frames, 500 at 12 points each, but we are able to generate, say, 15 intermediate frames and sample them. At a different resolution, because you know how many samples we generate depends on how many times we sample that that base Gaussian that I was showing. And here, the uh, the red part is sort of the center of the Gaussian, where we have most of the samples. It sort of depends on how the camera sees the object. Here, some more example of characterizations on objects that have thin parts. We can also do. Uh, 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 a process dimension, namely track the camera with respect to the object. And finally, we can uh, say, you know, label one frame. And then, because we can transfer these labels back to the canonical distribution and then propagate them forward again, we can now transfer labels to other frames. So, anyway, these three videos that I went in very, very fast were really meant to show some of the some of the architectures and designs that make it possible to deal with point cloud data, both in the static case and in the dynamic case. Okay, now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about a couple of other topics that uh, 
are different, but they are related in the sense that they also deal with this issue of joint learning. Uh, suppose we have this image that you see on the left, and then we train networks that compute various derived quantities you know, that are of interest in computer vision, for example, surface normals, reshading, this means what the image would look like if you put a light at the camera, depth, and curvature. And uh, well, it's reasonable outcomes, but you can see that there is detail in this part of this kernel that is just lost in this derived images. On the other hand, these derived images, they're not independent of, of each other because they refer to the same reality in the world. So the idea we had is what if you were to not just from the image say compute normals, but say from the image compute depth and normals, and then also from the depth compute normals and guarantee that those will be consistent. And so here, here I show what the outcome would be if we made all these things consistent with each other by having networks that map between these pairs. This is this crosswalk consistency learning. But essentially in the classical setting, we go from some input data to, to, to different outputs and we have separate losses. But here we introduce this cross cross consistency loss where not only do we want the result here to be good and the result here to be good based on our supervision, but we want if we go from X to Y1 and then from Y1 to Y2, we want this to agree with what we had if we go straight from X to Y2. So you can see here, for example, if we go from this, uh, this image, the surface normal, we get a very noisy result. But if, we, but, if we, but if we enforce consistency between image to normals and image to depth to normals, then we get maximum effect setting. So we had a lot of data from an earlier work on, uh, on multiple vision tasks that essentially is an indoor environment where we can estimate all of these different quantities at once. And then we started playing with what happens if we start to enforce consistency constraints. Again, this is joint learning between these tasks. And I think here you can see the, the benefit. So, so, so at the bottom, you go from this image directly to shading, curvature, texture, just normal speed points. And here, you go there, but you also go to depth first and then it's your consistency. And you can see the quality is better. It's another example where we go via normals. And here I show many different paths. And again, uh, some are okay, some are very bad, but if you, but, but if you have false consistency, they all start to look pretty good. I will not have time to go into much uh, detail about this. There's many interesting issues here because to do what I just said requires that you have consistent training data across all tasks. And that's of course, maybe hard to get. So we did several things to, to sort of decouple the losses. So you don't need consistent training data and also to estimate the, the losses in a perceptual, in a feature space, which is better when you have tasks that don't correlate that well. And if you try to force consistency with them in the image domain, you might actually cause yeah, more harm than good. And of course, I've just shown triangles here, but in general, there's a whole graph, a whole network of tasks. Right? And you want to guarantee that going, say, from X to Y2 via the green path is consistent with going from X to Y2 via, via, the, uh, via the, uh, the blue path. And this inconsistency defines a certain energy that is interesting. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and very briefly, we uh, looked at this in many types of visual data, for example, games or outdoor scenes, even though so our training was all on these indoor scenes and, and compared against many baselines. Um, and uh, again, this shows that as compared to the ground truth, we are better able to integrate information than the competing baselines. And this is more of the same in an, in an animation or in a, in a in a video form. So again, the cross cross consistency gives you sharper features, sharper edges. 
And what's interesting here is that the method also can be applied in new domains where it was never applied before and give lots of bad results. Uh, this is paintings, this is black and white movies, uh, this is um, some images from Chernobyl. In all of this, what's interesting is we find that the consistency energy being low correlates very well with good results. And so that means that we do domain shift, say, by blurring or by going from you know, inter scenes to outdoor scenes or to games, we can gauge how well we are doing by seeing how much the energy, how much this consistency energy goes up. And I have a small example here. I, um, here there's no compression, but you see as, as I make the images worse and increase the compression, then the consistency energy will start going up. And so this gives you a way to gauge how well you are doing when you transfer to out of domain data. Okay, I'm running short on time. So I'll very briefly mention the last two, two items that I had. Uh, here we were interested in understanding how differences in object shapes are described in language. So I will describe, say, this chair against this PD tractor by saying, oh, well, that's the one that has gaps in the back. So we developed this reference language game where person A looks at, he showed these three images of chairs in the same pose, one is selected, and she has to describe how this chair is different from the other two. And then the second person sees the same chairs in a different order and has to select the right one. And this problem can be hard or easy depending on how similar or dissimilar the three chairs are. And here's examples of the addresses we collected. As you can see, it, uh, this was the target, always the right one. They typically, they contain references to parts that one uh, chair has and the others don't, or maybe two attributes of parts, like vertical lines in the back. And in this way, we collected about uh, 80,000 utterances for about yeah, 4,000 chairs. And uh, well, humans, do uh, you know, pretty well on kind of easy toss when the chairs are different and still pretty well, but less well when they are more challenging. Anyway, we developed based on this data, neural speakers and listeners. Here's a neural listener that takes essentially the three images that the human sees, actually takes, they go through a big DG network and then there's an LCM that processes the language and here also they're given a point cloud, a 3D point cloud. And then essentially this listener has to uh, score these three chairs as to how well they meet the other ones. And this shows some examples uh, of this. Uh, these are the chair scores. You can see and red means that the world that played the most significant part, this attention on you know, in making this decision. Uh, and by and large, we found that these, these neural listeners do, do pretty well, maybe not as well as humans, but close, maybe in the 80% range. And of course, there are many difficult situations where language can be met metaphorical, can refer to materials or be ambiguous to counts. But what was interesting for us is that even though we just trained on chairs, the same machinery could be applied to new shapes, new objects that the uh, network had never seen before, like sofas or beds. We also developed neural speakers. And again, I will not go into any details about the architecture. And I show here some examples of utterances the speakers generated to distinguish the target chair on the right from the other two. The difference between the pragmatic speaker and the literal speaker is that the pragmatic speaker has a neural listener built into the, into the speaker to vet the answers of the speaker. In summary, what's going on here is that we have a tool that I think can be an interesting way to do a product search. You can use language and get shapes that meet that language. And what we found interesting, especially for us, I mentioned that this extends or generalizes to unseen shapes. 
And also, if you see all these phrases, typically they refer to parts, but nowhere in our representation did we tell that word up, yeah, about parts. Actually, the networks were given the image and the point cloud, the 3D of the whole chain. There was no part information. Yet somehow the network managed to disentangle that and understand parts. Okay, I'm essentially out of time. Let me finish with the last thing that's ongoing work. Uh, here we try to, again, marry language and vision, but look at the emotional aspect of images. Uh, we, we started from, from Wikia, these are 80,000 paintings in the public domain. And we started with paintings because paintings are things that are meant to evoke emotion. And we showed uh, uh, essentially annotators, um, something like this, they see a painting and they see this list of nine standard emotions. They're supposed to select the emotional experience from this painting and also give us a linguistic explanation as to why they experience this emotion. So for example, here is a painting and you get a wide variety of responses as you can see here. Uh, not everybody reacts the same way. And what we found interesting is the richness of the language that is given in these responses um, because they involve similes and, and analogies, metaphors, recollections. It's really very different from, say, if, say if you look at standard annotations of images where you annotate the objects or the actions, say you search Coco for bird, you see images where birds appear, right? Real birds appear. But if you know data set, the ultimate data set, you look for uh, the word bird, you find things like this. Uh, well, it's this mustache looks like a bird. The woman's ability to handle the bird so calmly inspires a sense of bewilderment. Here's an image where the explanation talks about birds but there's no birds visible in the image. And again, people sort of use their imagination. They see things in the image. Anyway, it's time for me to wrap up. Uh, let me just say that we also build uh, generators, uh, speakers that can try to give an, an image, generate a sentiment, an explanation. Here are some examples. So again, these are all you know, deep nets that generate these responses. We can also tell the network what the emotion should be and ask it to justify the emotion. So we can get different responses for the same painting. But anyway, I'm out of time. So let me try to, to finish here. Uh, I, the, the main topic of my talk was the notion of joint learning that we can do better by aggregating data, modalities, and learning tasks into connected networks that pass information to each other. And I try to show a couple of techniques that leverage the power of joint learning. Um, let me finish by uh, mentioning this quote from Heraclitus. He was a Greek philosopher before Socrates, uh, quite, quite famous actually because he has many, many aphorisms. But one that I've liked and I think is appropriate here is this. He said, even though in life, many things have a common cause or a common reason, many live as though each of them has its own separate sort of explanation. And I think it's an appropriate comment to make here because I think the way deep architectures are structured today, we solve each learning task separately, even though many of these learning tasks refer to the same reality out in the world. And I think we could do better if we had less private understandings among our learners and more communication so we can arrive at a at what is common, the shared understanding. And with that, I want to 
and then thank my group and my many collaborators in this works and also my, my sponsors. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Wonderful, thank you, Leo. So that was a, a, a tour de force over joint learning. So you talked about joint learning over data modalities and over space and time. Time, so that's at the data level. You talked about uh, le joint learning over different representations. So that's somehow at like kind of the model representation level. And then zooming way back out, you talked about joint learning over sort of the task level, like sort of jointly uh, solving two separate tasks with sort of the same inputs. And these things are all correlated. And the intuition is that as you approach these problems sort of jointly, you can exploit those correlations to sort of um, do, do uh, better on, on certain tasks across different voting mechanisms, across different abstractions um, and different forms of invariance. So along those lines, I actually have kind of two questions for you down two different paths. One is technical and one is more um, keeping in the spirit of, of HAI, but more about applications and, and uh, impact on, on society. So on the, technical level, I was sort of struck by something you mentioned in talking about um, your point, I, I believe it's called point net. Yeah. Um, and you're making you're contrasting it to convolutional neural networks for uh, point clouds versus images. And you said some of the invariances that you'd like in point cloud data are invariances to point permutation, invariances to spatial transformation, and invariances into sampling. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak a bit more at an intuitive level how the actual model architecture gives rise to those invariances? Well, um, yes, I mean, uh, the, the invariance to the point ordering is built in. That is the whole point of the symmetric aggregation. Symmetric means that the order doesn't matter. It's a function of the set of values, not of the order in which the values are given. So point and point plus plus fully satisfy the permutation invariance. They're symmetric functions. And in fact, mm -hmm. we show that actually any symmetric function can be approximated by a point and plus plus like architecture. So that is so it's actually it's a universal architecture for symmetric functions. Now Got it. the second one, the invariance to pose or to transformation, this is only approximately enforced. This is not guaranteed. There are, in the diagram I showed, there are certain canonicalization stages that try to essentially put the points in a canonical frame of reference. Not just in 3D, but in higher dimensions until you go through these different stages. Uh, and this gives, I mean, this tries to enforce the uh, transformation invariance, but it's only approximate, there's no guarantee. And the sampling invariance is really a topic of current research. That is, uh, it turns out there's a big difference as to whether samples move off the surface or along the surface. And this relates to many issues about adversarial attacks on point clouds. Mm. Um, Things moving off the surface is more classical. This is kind of typically noise. But things moving on the surface actually can make a very big difference. And understanding how to make the network invariant to that is something that we are looking at. So these are all this in the data. We've, we've, we've accomplished the first one, partially the second one, and little of the third one. Okay, and, that, that, that matches my intuition because I was really scratching my head about how you'd enforce the, 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 the sec second and third one. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So there's a couple of questions from the chat related to sort of the last part of your talk. So yeah. kind of two twin questions. So the first is like for the effective language for visual art analysis, does it matter whether the training data comes from the general public or from art critics? And the second question about that is sort of um, how how does um, can you elaborate a bit more on the model architecture and the training data and how much data you need to sort of train one of those models? Yes, on the first question, um, the data we collected is from mechanical workers with some filters, but they are not at all art experts. 
And we are now trying to collect some data from our experts to see if they are different, but we don't really have that. As you might imagine, the volume of data we can collect like that is much, much, uh, much, much smaller. Uh, there's also, I mean, many philosophical issues here because in the cognitive science community, there is even debate whether the brain has special networks for emotion. If that is true, perhaps there's no explanation in language. I mean, it could be that you feel anger, but you cannot explain why you feel anger. Uh, but it seems not to be true. I mean, and, and even though we saw great variation in the answers as compared to normal image captioning, we also did a, a test where we asked people to, to, to say whether what somebody else said is a reaction that they consider reasonable. And, and the overwhelming majority said that, yes, that is, even if they didn't think this was the emotion they would convey, they think that was a reasonable sort of response. So there is structure to these to this responses and the 800 pound gorilla in the room is the, is, is the user, the human user, how to model that. Because people that will talk about, oh, you know, this reminds me of my childhood, something or other. Somehow you, you have to be able to capture what's in this box. So it's not just sort of the, you know, the image, it's sort of yeah, the, from the interaction between the image and the brain that, that you want to capture. And then you ask me a second question, which I uh, can you say it again. Yeah, it, it's 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 more along. Can you uh, elaborate a bit more on the model architecture um, for solving that task? Well, to be honest, I mean the key contribution we tried right now was uh, to just collect the data. I mean, this is very very new work, and so the I mean we just played a little bit with completely off the shelf architectures like you know M two transformers and um, and and show and tell. I mean, there's, there's nothing new in the in the affective speakers. They would just see if we can do something with the data we had. Um, I, I don't know if there is some, some interesting way to tailor the speaker architectures for such data. I mean, that's something to be explored. We, I mean, we haven't done that. And then, you know, another question that has come up is, um, you know, there was, after sort of the first convolutional neural networks, the models were sort of shared openly that spurred a lot of research into transfer learning. Like sort of what else can I do with these learned representations from these models, uh, applying it to different tasks? Have you seen a similar um, phenomenon emerge with uh, respect to point cloud data sets? I imagine those data are becoming more prevalent and if you have published uh, the point cloud model architecture, are people sort of taking that and adapting it in new ways that maybe your group hadn't considered yet? Is that a thriving community or is there more work to do? Yes, I mean, no, the point cloud work has, has exploded. I mean, there's, 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 there's now literally tens of thousands of papers on point cloud processing. Uh, it has been picked up a lot by the self-driving car community, because for them, this is very important technology to be able to, uh, because they, they have your LIDARs, they have sensors that produce this kind of data. And, and, and so uh, I think people have taken what we started and gone much further with it. Part of it is the proprietary, and I think we don't know the, the details, but in terms of the sheer number of papers published on point clouds, it's in the many thousands now. Uh, wow. Okay, well, we're at the, the top of the hour. Thank you so much for the, the fascinating talk, Leo. And um, thank you, HAI audience, for tuning in. I suppose, please join me in a, in a virtual round of applause. We'll have to envision, uh, hear that in our heads. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And HAI, we'll see you next week. Okay, thank you, Deep. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for coming.